Today on this old house, our 170-year-old columns are restored with something called peanut butter fill. It's time to forge an iron gate. It's never too soon to start thinking about finishes, so today we start with lighting. What about something like this? What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice, nice. Here is right on. Ooh, and the smell just changed. That's bad guano. Oh, lovely. Now it's your turn to save it for the <laughs> next generation. The money's in the detail. Oh, that is beautiful. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor, and welcome back to this old house here in Charleston, South Carolina where we are working on two antique houses, and this is one of them. They call it a Charleston Single. It was built in 1840, and its signature feature is what they call the piazza, the porches, and there are actually two of them, one that runs all the way down the side of the first floor, and one all the way down the second floor. And when you enter the house through the main door, you actually enter onto the piazza. Now you can see that this needed a lot of work. So we actually started from the bottom and we shored up those brick piers as well as some of the framing underneath here. We've laid down some new deck boards and we addressed the columns. There was a whole line of them down below. You can sort of see the shape of them from the ones up top. And these were in really bad shape with a lot of rot. So we sent them out to a specialty mill shop. Hey Travis, good to see you. Hey Kevin, how are you? All right, so we sent you uh, eight of these, right? You did. I mean, you looked at them. I mean, what did we send you? I mean, what, what do you know about these now? Well, they're 1800s. Uh, they're over 100 years old. Uh, they're all heart pine, Tuscan style columns. I mean, solid all the way through, right? They, they are. They were, they were made out of one, piece of one piece of log. And so these two came together. So this was a 10 foot log. It, it, it was. We've cut the bottom off of this one. This is the bottom that was on this one. It had an extensive rod in the bottom from the handrail joints down. So. so that's the heart pine right there. That's good wood. You can see the remnants of the handrail on here. Yes. Every column gets cut from here down? It does. We're cutting all of them from the handrail down. That's where yeah. the water usually gets in the uh, mortise pocket and starts the rot process. And, I mean, were any of them original to our house, do you think? I think half of them were. Half of them have been replaced over time uh, right. from an ar architectural salvage depot or something like that, but they were replaced with an older column as well. So, I mean, now it's our job to fix them. I mean, I hate to ask it, but why not just replace them? I mean, wouldn't it be cheaper and easier if we just went and got a replica? It, it, it would be, but in, in Charleston, they like us to restore rather than to replace. It okay. keeps the historic fabric of the building uh, makes the BAR happy, and uh, it's just uh, the thing to do here in Charleston. Makes us happy too. So, what is the process for fixing them? You've already cut this off, and uh, you're ready to cut right here? We are. We're going to cut this off, and then we're going to salvage what's left of the column, which is about a five foot section. This is all still good? It is still good. What goes here? This is going to be a new turn piece. We're going to glue up a new piece, stack laminate it, and get them ready for the lathe. All right, let's start the surgery. You ready right. to cut that? Yes, sir. What do you think? Did we go far enough? It looks good, Kevin. Looks, looks like we got all the rod out. We got a little filling to do here, but we're gonna drill a hole in this to accept the new plug anyway. So I think we're good. We're ready for the next stage. Wow, that is the new material? It is. It what? started out as 10 quarter Sapili mahogany. We've dressed it down to just over two inches now. Uh, now he's, he's laminating it with, with epoxy, stack layering it. Uh, getting it ready to be clamped up for the One, plug. One, two, three, four, five Five pieces. layers, five layers. And this is what we get when we're done. That's what this, you call this, the plug. This is the plug. It'll sit overnight 24 hours so it can cure and then we're ready to go to the lathe. Let me show you. Kevin, this is where we take those plugs we glued up on the other end. We bring them down here. We make a template to match the profile that we need. We put it on the machine and we start turning. He's about 90% done with this one. We're, we're on the final pass. 
after he gets done with the final pass, he'll turn the receptor tenon, which, which locks it in. So you can see the following template right there. Exactly, that, that follows it, traces it, almost like a key machine in sense. So how long is it gonna take them to go from the plug to a finished piece here? The overall time is about an hour and a half to get to this point. Kevin, this is the plug that we had glued up earlier and we've got it spun. We're ready to attach it to the column that we've turned upside down. We've got it secured. Cooper's gonna put it on here for us and show us how we do it. So that's the bottom going into this. It is. More epoxy. More epoxy, same epoxy we use to stack laminate it. We're gonna put a generous amount up here on top of the column and then of course on top of the plug itself and then he'll, he'll put it up in place. All right, now we're ready to attach this thing. Holy mackerel. Now that we've got it in place, he's gonna toe screw it with three inch screws. So now we're back up to the full length of the column. Kevin, the guys will do a dry fit here, the same as we did on the bottom repair on the other columns. They'll get it tweaked out just right and then we'll, we'll be ready to glue this one. This one's already been glued. We started putting the fairing filler on it, which is a peanut butter, what we call, uh, which is just a mix of epoxy and a, and a fairing filler. It gets peanut buttered and then it stands about 10 hours and then we're ready to sand. Come on over and I'll show you. Kevin, this one's been drying overnight. He's starting the sanding process now. After he gets it sanded up, everything's smooth. We're ready to put a coat of primer on it. Then it's ready to come back to the job site. Which is actually where I'm headed next. Travis, thank you so much, you and your guys. We appreciate you saving our old column. Thank you. That was awesome. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial free. Watch it all in the This Old House app and join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Last week we saw some of the designs for the iron gate in front of our Charleston single house. Today we find out what design was chosen and we see some of the work begin. Now Joe is one of the students here at the American College of the Building Arts and one of the designers. Hi Joe, how's it going? Hey Tommy, how are you? What did the homeowners decide? So this is the gate that the homeowners decided on. It's a little bit different than the gates that we looked at last week. They wanted wow. a little bit more of a simpler design so we went downtown and looked at some gates, historic gates in the Charleston area, and drew some inspiration from that. This is quite a piece right here. What do you call this thing? So this uh, is kind of a horizontal motif that has some half laps in here. Work the same way as half laps in wood. Oh, I see. So you have a notch in the piece, inlays, and then becomes flush. Exactly. And we cut off a saw and chisel it out, too. Same process. Oh, pretty cool. Right here, we've got a uh, scroll overthrow just to kind of give the piece a little bit more movement. So that's the top of the gate right there. Exactly. Pretty yeah. nice. I like these twists right here. Yeah, the twists give it a little bit more of a contemporary feel to it, and it gives it a little bit more movement because iron, you can really bend it and morph it in any way and just give it a flow. So now this is a scale drawing, and this is a pretty good sized gate. It's almost six feet tall and it's five feet wide. Exactly. So from the scale drawing, I notice that you have here, is this the actual dimension of the pieces? This is the actual size of the uh, horizontal motif, and that's the actual size of the scroll overthrow. Mm -hmm. It just, drawing it out in actual size gives us a little bit more uh, certainty when we're yeah. creating the piece. So it's like of, a template, so you can take the piece and lay it over it, but if you wanted to make multiple pieces, 
they'll all be the same. Exactly. It's pretty cool. So uh, I'd love to watch you get started. Awesome. Let's. Okay. About how hot is that fire? It's about 3,000 degrees. 3,000 degrees? Yeah. So when you're hitting there, I could actually hear the steel become soft by the sound of it. You know, you can feel the hammer pushing. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So now you start to make the dub. Let's see how this looks up against the drawing. First, okay. I'm going to put some tracing paper over so I don't dirty up the, the uh, drawing. Okay. Wow. A little bit more fine tuning and we'll have it. Well, you're almost there. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to say, Joe, that took a lot of work. How long is it going to take you to just to make this one top piece? Probably a week just for one of these sections right here. So two weeks. Exactly. Wow. Well, how long is it going to take to build the whole gate? It could take us around two months to make the entire gate. Wow, that's a lot of work, but very impressive. Yeah. Nice job. Thank you. Now you can watch This Old House and Ask This Old House anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovation, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. And best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. If you live in downtown Charleston, you probably want some wrought iron in your front yard, but finding somebody to make you a gate like this is hard. In fact, it's one of the reasons why the American College of the Building Arts even exists. And Joe and Kaylin know that they are lucky to have a place nearby to learn the old world craft of blacksmithing. <laughs> Well, I originally wanted to do timber framing, but when I came down to the school for my orientation, I don't know, I was just like blown away by blacksmithing. I was like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> it's just so cool. I'd never seen it before in my life, so. Like a love at first sight kind of thing? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I had already gone to a more academically minded college in Washington State, and I had done physical science and theater and all kinds of different stuff, and I really started to zero in on the architecture and the ironwork, and it's that thing where you cannot unsee it once you see it. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at sculptural programs in iron, and as soon as I saw the American College of the Building Arts, I just, I knew that that was where I wanted to go. There are several trades you could have um, taken up when mm -hmm. you went to the school. Mm -hmm. How did you decide on blacksmithing? I think the idea of having this really solid material that you don't think of as moving much and then turning it into this really plastic, fluid thing um, in the process of forging it is a, a really fascinating process. It's not like when you're working with wood, you can set it down and walk away and just kind of go back to it when you want. When you're working with iron, you pull that thing out of the fire and you've got a minute a minute and 30 seconds to figure out what's going on and look at it and make assessments as you go. Had you forged before you came to the school? No, I had never seen a coal forge. I'd never heated up a piece of metal or struck it with a hammer, so. What did that feel like the first time it came out glowing red and you whacked it on the anvil? You can't get anything done with blacksmithing unless you get it hot and hit it hard. Um, they say strike while the iron is hot and it's very true. If you try to hesitate or wait or just you're not prepared when that piece is coming out of the fire then you will spend so long chasing your tail you're never gonna get it. The things to be thinking about is how hot is it? Where am I moving this material? Am I trying to move material? Am I trying to straighten? Am I trying to flatten? Am I trying to bend, push, pull? The shape that the iron makes is the space between the anvil and your hammerhead. So that exact shape and the exact articulation of your hammer and how the piece is being held against the anvil all make a difference in what the outcome is. 
So I'm looking at this piece behind you right here, and what do you think when you see something like that, something that has lasted so long, that something is so renowned here in town? Just to think that a couple hundred years ago, somebody thought up that design and just, there it is. The sword gates of Charleston are super famous, and the gentleman that made these, Christopher Werner, is a German immigrant, and these are so elegantly made. They're very sort of delicate in a way, which you don't really think of iron as being delicate necessarily. What is that like when you're in that little area, when you guys are all pounding away together? Uh, it's a pretty cool rhythm to get in when you're forging with others in the shop and just seeing what other people get up to. I think one of the best parts about blacksmithing is partner forging, where you've got one person who's kind of directing the work, and the other guy's got the sledgehammer, and they're pounding away, kind of providing extra muscle. Mm -hmm. What do your friends say when um, someone says, oh yeah, she's a blacksmith? A lot of times people's reaction is, is that still a thing? Um, which is kind of an interesting uh, perspective to have. But yeah, it's pretty cool. I think a lot of people are really happy um, to hear about what I do and uh, definitely just to know that there's still folks who are doing it. I think it's pretty cool. I love being a blacksmith. At this phase of the project, our homeowners are staying very busy picking their finishes. And so we've come to a lighting showroom to see what kind of fixtures that Kathleen likes. She certainly has a lot of choices in this place. Hey, Kathleen. Hi, Allie. Hey, Hi, Kevin. Kevin. So we've come to the right place for lights, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I guess the first question I have for you is what's your style? Modern. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's our first challenge since <laughs> yes. we've got a house from the 1800s. <laughs> yes. And so what are you guys thinking? Where do you want to start? I'm thinking the kitchen. Let's start with the kitchen. Oh, Great. We've got, yeah, some wonderful things going on in there. The basic layout is sort of counters and appliances around the perimeter. Big island in the middle. Super island, yeah. So we need to focus our light. We need a good light over this island, but we also need some task lighting in here, Kathleen, as yes. well. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of challenges to lighting this house. I mean, aside from the fact that you like modern in an 1800s house. <laughs> yes, I know. Here's some renderings of the kitchen, and mm -hmm. you can see we have the exposed brick. There are not a lot of windows, and it's a narrow lot, so there's not a lot of light. I mean, without the natural light and all that brick, it's really going to suck up a lot of light that you put in here. Absolutely. That's great, and I would love to really accent that brick, too. I think that's a great look. Yeah, we should focus on some island lights, too, okay, so you great. can have good task lighting in there. Okay, right. perfect. Pendants? What do you got for us? I'm thinking some pendants would be great. Yeah, okay. I've got a few things over here that we could look at. Kathleen, what about something like this? Ooh. This yeah, would be great. It comes in so many great. different colors. Yeah, you could use it in the stainless steel. Absolutely. No. Do two of those over the island. That would be great task light. Sounds so if great. So you went stainless, you'd have the modern materials, although the shape is sort of old fashioned. You'd see that kind of in a factory, maybe. Best of both worlds. Can that be on the list? Absolutely. Nice. What else do we need to think about? Fan, a fan for the master bedroom. Oh, I've got a whole room of fans back here. Let's take great. a look. Yeah. We've got a ton of fans to choose from in this room. I've got traditional, contemporary, an island look, just an all white, clean, simple. What do you think of this thing? Was this a wow. water wheel or something? <laughs> that thing. That's crazy, isn't That's it? <laughs> a little big for our application. Um, Ooh, I like that one right there. Oh, that's a good choice. Yeah. Well, what do you like about that? Look, it looks like it's hand carved, uh, the modern design. It's very sleek. It looks like a, a propeller to an airplane. It's called the aviation fan. How about that? Huh? But it does not have a light on the bottom like a lot of these. Do you need light up there? No, actually we didn't want a light. We're going to use table lamps and wall lights. All right. So that can be on the list? Absolutely. Let's get the specs and show it to Scott. Good. Yeah, okay. See what he thinks. What else do we have to look at? How about the dining room? Perfect. Let's go. Okay. So the dining room is a long, narrow space. And we have a custom sunken cypress table being made. And wow. we want to have something that's going to showcase the table. Yeah, that's going to be very cool. Oh, it sounds like it. What about something like this, Kathleen? This is very Ooh. modern with the acrylic and the polished nickel accents on it. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I think it might be a little bit too much glam for Scott. Yeah, you might want to check with your husband on that one. Although, does Scott even get a vote? He does. This is his room. Oh, OK. I have another option. What about something like this? This is a little Ooh. more transitional okay. between the modern and the traditional look. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I love the glass and I love the chrome. And, and what about the size? Or actually, what about the quantity? Do you do one or do two of these? 
I think I really need to see the space before we can determine that. So that's probably the next step for you guys is grab some samples, bring them down to the house, and actually see them in the area. Yeah, yeah let's do that. Yeah, right. sounds, sounds like you great. Got a plan. Okay. But I do appreciate you showing us around. Okay. <laughs> Across town in Judith's house, the crew is addressing the siding, and it's in pretty rough shape. Now I know the easiest way to deal with this would be to rip it all off and replace it with new. Problem is, you have some pretty strict rules, and Jeff. Uh, you're dealing with this siding. It's in pretty tough shape. Yeah, it's uh, it's in pretty bad shape. We got uh, probably about 60% of this we need to replace based on the uh, Board of Architecture Review, uh, based so, on their mandate. So they come out and they look at it and they say, you got to save 60% of it no matter what you do. Correct. So the, I guess the biggest problem is not is getting it off, but matching this profile. Now, uh, up north we have this is actually called a novelty siding. Correct. Dutch lap siding is what we call it down here. Yep. But yeah, it's a it's an off-the-shelf product, uh, oh, as really? you can see here. Oh, really? It's off-the-shelf? Yep. So the old looks like it's a pine also, hot pine maybe. Correct. The new is southern pine, pressure treated. Pressure uh, treated. Primed. Primed on all six sides. How's the profile match up? Oh, wow, that matches up pretty good. So obviously you guys must use this a lot down here. Yep, it's used quite a bit. All right. So it looks like there was a window here and you had some shot pieces from the door to this window and you removed all these shot ones here from between the windows. Well, that's pretty good. You're going to try to remove them and save them. Correct. We're going to set them aside and then we'll use these smaller pieces to feather in with the uh, rot damage and termite damage on the side of the house. I see. And then take this new stuff and run it from window to door so you have no joints. Correct. Now what you want to do is you want to get this siding off and you want to salvage it. If you look right here, you can see the siding is face nailed and it's nailed up kind of high. The reason they nail it up high is two reasons. Number one, when you nail it up high, it holds the siding tight against the siding below. But it's also important that this nail doesn't go through this piece of siding right here because as the wood expands and contracts, you want this piece to slide on this rabbit right here. Now you can take a nail set and drive these nails through, but the chances of the siding being split are pretty good. The best way to remove the nails is cut them. All right, now that we've got some of the siding removed, Scotty and I are going to install a new piece. Now the house isn't level and the siding isn't level, but we want to install it straight and true with the existing siding. So the old siding that was left with inserted a new piece in between them. And this will run long. So Scotty can nail that. And then what you're going to do, the next piece will cut to go from this piece to the door and that will all line up. So then you're gonna have a weave where you have old, new, old, new, work your way up the wall with some new and weave the rest of the house. Well, Jeff, you got your work cut out for you here. We do, we probably have another week or so on the front of this house just to, to get this siding all tied in. Yeah, and it's gonna look good. Let's put one right there, Scotty. Next week, we tour the colorful homes of Charleston to help Judith a color for her siding. That's next time on This Old House. Next time on This Old House. We're going to repair some 19th century plaster. I believe this is made out of oyster shells. Oh, really? We want to have something that makes Judith and Julia's home stand out. So if the pastels of Rainbow Row are not our inspiration, what should be our inspiration? And today's challenge is rot. When you find a piece like this, does it stay or does it go? Thanks for watching. This Old House has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.